You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. <coughs> Welcome, friends, to a Bible answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I serve as the moderator of this program. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and 57 congregations of the Churches of Christ all throughout this region. We're grateful to each one of them. Without them, we could not bring this program to you. We've got three gospel preachers who have been doing a fantastic job all this month answering your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hi, my name is Mike Hickson. I preach for the Olive Branch Church of Christ. We are in Olive Branch, Mississippi, just across the Memphis line. Love to invite you to our services. On Sunday morning, we have a program titled Anchor the Soul. We air each and every Sunday on the ABC affiliate Channel 24 at 10 a.m. Love to have you come and visit that program. Hello, I'm John DeBerry, Jr. I'm the minister of the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. And we thank the Lord for the opportunity to speak with you. We realize that in Him we live, we move, we have our being. And the more we study and let Him talk to us, the better lives we're going to have. Hello, my name is Jared Rhodes. I'm one of the ministers at the Olive Branch Church of Christ, and I look forward to digging deeper in Scripture and deciding and deciphering and understanding what God gave us as an answer. We're so glad to have each of these brethren with us today, and we're appreciative to you for sending us these good questions. Our first question today goes to Brother Hickson. If God does not hear the prayer of sinners, how can they be saved? Brother Hickson. Well, that's an interesting question. Matter of fact, I would say it's probably a very popular question. But I want to say at the onset of our study with regard to this particular question, that in Scripture, nowhere do we find authority for the quote-unquote sinner's prayer. Now, I know that in many religious circles that is often used to encourage people to become a child of God. But you can go back and look at the record from Matthew to Revelation and you will never read of the quote unquote sinner's prayer that brings about the conversion of a sinner or an alien sinner. But you, go, you can go back to Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus had asked the disciples on one occasion about His identity. And you remember they said some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets, but then He wanted to know what they thought about him. And Peter said that he was a Christ, the son of the living God. And based upon that, Jesus then said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he promised in verse 18 to build the church. In verse 19, he told Peter and the apostles that they would be the recipients of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys signify authority. In John chapters 14, 15, and 16, we have an extended dis discourse between Jesus and the apostles. He promised them that following His departure that they would receive the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. The Comforter would bring all things to their remembrance and teach them all things. In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And so they were His divine ambassadors. They were divinely sent. On Pentecost Day, they were the recipients of the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible tells us that they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, they were speaking intelligible languages that previously were unknown to them. They did so so that all who were assembled in Jerusalem might have the opportunity to hear the gospel for the very first time in all of its fullness. And you remember down in verse 36, the Bible tells us that Peter said to those who were present, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you've crucified, God's made both Lord and Christ. Now Luke said, when they heard this, they were pricked or cut to the heart. And they cried out and said unto Peter and the rest of the brethren, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here's what Peter said. Well, let me just say this. Let me tell you what he didn't say. He did not say, let everybody bow your head and then accept the Lord Jesus into your heart and recite this prayer. That's not what he said. 
Peter, an inspired apostle, along with the others. They were God's divinely appointed spokesmen. Peter said, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Did Peter know what he was talking about? Well, again, he was an inspired spokesman. God had promised him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, keys signifying authority. So on Pentecost Day, Peter and the apostles took the keys of the kingdom that had been given to them. You can read about that in Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18. They took those keys, unlocked the doors into that kingdom or church established and bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Today, all who want to become Christians, that is, those who are outside of sin, rather outside of Christ, and sin is the problem. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. The answer to sin is the blood of Christ. And the only way that we can appropriate that blood is to go where it was shed. It was shed in death, John 19, 34 and 35. That's why Paul said, Know ye not that all we who are baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. On Pentecost Day, God set forth the pattern for how to become one of His children. Well, what's that pattern? We've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We must be willing to repent of sin. Repentance is a change of heart followed by a change in our actions. And then confessing the sweet name of Christ. We are baptized into Christ so that we might contact the blood of Christ and be added to the body of Christ, Acts 2 verse 47. When we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we then enjoy salvation, Mark 16, 16. We are said to be forgiven of our sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Our sins are washed away, Acts 22, 16, and we become a part of the kingdom of Almighty God. Once we become a child of God, if we stumble and fall, God's second law of pardon then applies. And here's what John said in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All who have never obeyed the gospel must believe in Jesus, repent of sin, and be baptized. Once we become a child of God, if we stumble and fall, we have Jesus functioning as our advocate, as John said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We confess, we repent, and we enjoy forgiveness. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. Back on uh, Saturday, August the 26th, I was privileged to take part in the 28th Annual Southeast Missouri Lectureship in Farmington, Missouri, and I and several others took part in an open forum that day. The next series of questions that we're going to address were asked by uh, people in the pew during that open forum there at Farmington. Now, the topic of the of the lectureship was on Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, and his books, and that's the reason why some of these questions will be dealing with Jeremiah and the book of Jeremiah. Our first question goes to Brother DeBerry, can God repent the reference Jeremiah 18, 8 through 10? Brother DeBerry. I think there's several things we need to understand about God from the offset of this question because there are so many misunderstandings about God. God the Father represents perfection. God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, and God is universally present. Also, God the Father, God the Son, the God, and God the Holy Spirit, three divine personalities with one divine nature, three who have one aim. God the Father plans all. God the Son executes all. God the Holy Spirit brings order out of chaos. Considering this, then we have to go to Jeremiah's statement in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verses 8. If that nation against whom uh, I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Understand something about God. God doesn't get surprised or caught off guard or ambushed. Uh, God didn't say, has never said, oops, didn't see that coming. Uh, God knows before uh, we do anything. God will not violate our free moral agency. Uh, but at the same time, God is God. Before there was sin, 
there was already a savior. Before the foundation of the world, God had already planned the perpetuation of our sin, the substitute of our sin through and by Jesus Christ. That said, we got to understand what anthropomorphism is. We, the Bible speaks of God's eyes. We know that God doesn't have eyes. God's hands. We know that God doesn't have hands. Uh, God's mouth or God's heart. All of that is basically using something that we understand so that we can understand uh, something that uh, we don't understand. In essence, a spirit had not flesh and blood, and God is a spirit. So what is Jeremiah speaking of here when he says God repents? Basically, God is a great God. <clears throat> God is a God of long suffering, a God of kindness, and a God of mercy. God is not willing that any should perish. God wants all to come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. God takes no delight in the destruction of the wicked. That said, what does it mean? God is saying that if my people return, if they repent, then God will also remove the curse or what he had planned to bring upon them. When we go to Exodus chapter 32, while Moses was up in the mountain receiving the laws that God gave him, the Ten Commandments, as we call them, the children of Israel were down in the valley building a golden calf. Aaron, who was the specialist in that type of metallurgy, had built the calf. They were dancing. The Bible said the people rose up to play. Uh, God let Moses know, I'm getting ready to wipe them out. I'm getting ready to destroy them. But Moses, of course, said, and he begged the Lord, and the Lord, the Bible says in verses 14 of Exodus chapter 32, the Lord repented of the evil that he thought to do to his people. Because Moses pled with him, God repented. God withheld his wrath and his malice and therefore gave his love. God always gives us what we need and not what we deserve. When, when Abraham was told that God was going to destroy the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He came before God and pled before God, what if I find 50 as though God had not already read everybody's heart? What if I find 40, 30, 20? God even said, you find 10 souls there that are worthy of salvation and I will not destroy the land because part of God's nature is he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Guess what? He couldn't find them. And God did not repent. And God destroyed the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think it can be said any better than it was said in the book of 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 2 and verses 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins. I will heal their land. God is ready to be long suffering. But when the Bible speaks of God repenting, it's not saying that God did wrong, that God was caught off guard, that God saw something that he didn't expect. What it is saying is, God is so filled with love and long suffering and forgiveness that if he can see those who are contrite, he will withhold his wrath. We in America need to really take heart to that because God is examining us right now. And what God sees is the same thing he saw when he repented that he had made man in Genesis chapter six. You know what God said of his assessment his every thought and intent was wicked continually. America needs to take an introspective examination of itself. We need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, are we daring God and calling on God's wrath to destroy us? We need to repent and turn from our wicked ways. Great question. Thank you. Well, great answer, Brother D. Barry. You know this 
This year I've been preaching meetings on turning points. One of the sermons, Turning Point for America. But I also preach a sermon on turning point for a city. And that city that I preach about is the city of Nineveh. And in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10, God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that He said He would do unto them and He did it not. What does it mean that He repented? Well, He simply turned from the punishment that He had planned. But why did He do that? Because they had turned. Because they had repented. And God has spoken today concerning punishment that is to come on the wicked. But He'll withdraw that punishment from all who, like Nineveh, will repent and turn to Him. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. This tract is entitled, Be Baptized. This is the fifth in a series of tracts on the steps of salvation. If you would like this tract on Be Baptized, or if you'd like our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, we'd be happy to send you the first lesson. If you will simply study it with your Bible, send it back to us, we will grade it, and then we'll send you lesson two. And if you complete all eight lessons of the course, you will receive a certificate of completion. So if you'd like to have our Bible course or our tract or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Reach us by our website at www.abibleanswertv.org. You know, you can watch a Bible answer on our website, and you can also watch it on our YouTube channel, just search for A Bible Answer TV and then subscribe. It's absolutely free. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And then whenever you open up your app, you'll see the latest offerings of A Bible Answer right there before you. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you know there's a great search engine on that channel where you can look up, say, baptism, and it will search the different scripts and you can find different programs where a particular subject has been addressed on a Bible Answer. You can also email us at a Bible Answer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll-free number with your request, 1-800-436-0463. Back to our questions today to Brother Jared Rhodes. Are the sons of God in Genesis 6-2 angels? Brother Rhodes. Hey, I appreciate so much your question. As you go to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2, I'd encourage you to look at it and recognize in the context what we have going on. He says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. We've got two separate groups of individuals that he recognizes. Now, throughout Scripture, God talks about groups of people. For instance, you go to Matthew chapter 7, You've got those that choose righteousness that are walking on the straight and narrow path and there is a reward for them. You also have those that are walking on a, a wide path. They go enter at the broad way. And he says that the, the end thereof is the ways of death. It's destruction. That's where they're headed. As you look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2, I believe we have two groups and I think the uh, context there dictates that. He says in verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Another thing that we need to recognize throughout Scripture, God uses men or worldliness or uh, many other phrases to recognize or to characterize ungodliness. Uh, for instance, if you turn over to 1 John chapter 2, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, Love not the world nor the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Within worldliness, we have a group of people. These people aren't Christians. They aren't living for Christ. And therefore, they will receive a just reward for their actions. Back in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2, we see the daughters of men. You know, mankind as a whole chooses in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 many there be which go in there at they choose the broad way the easy path the no matter what I do I can do it my way 
So we've got this broad path in opposition to a narrow path. In Genesis chapter 6, it refers to it as sons of God. Who do they follow? Who do they believe? Who do they obey? They're followers of God. Versus the daughters of men, people that choose worldliness. Now, as you look in verse 6, it recognizes in verse 2 that the daughters of men were fair. He said they were pretty. Now, you look at the, the real world that... Well, the New Testament bears it out. You go to John chapter 7 and verse 24. He says, judge not according to the peers, but judge a righteous judgment. Don't just look at the outside, but what's the facts? When a judgment takes place, it ought to be according to their fruits, the actions that they commit. He said, look, these old boys, these good old boys, these sons of God, these guys that were trying to do right, they looked at the outward appearance. They said, now she's pretty. And he refers to them as daughters of men because they weren't interested in godliness. They were interested in worldliness. You go down in verse 2, it says, And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now they made their bad decision. I would say if I was to take a time out, I'd say if there's a young man watching this, be very careful who you marry. Sons of God are destroyed by daughters of men. It was a fact in Genesis 6, and it's a fact today. Go down and look at verse 3, and I think the facts are evident. He says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. God said, I have had enough. When sons of God choose because of appearance rather than godliness, things are going to come about where you have problems. In Genesis chapter 6, it happens. And because of that, we're going to see the earth gets destroyed by water. We're going to see a flood come about because God says it's time for a cleansing. The reality is that when sons of God stoop so low as to quit caring about the heart and quit caring about spiritual things and, and desiring worldliness instead, when they allow one to bring them down, consider David. He allowed the beauty of one woman to bring him down to where he turned his back on God. He's not doing what's right. You know, as you go throughout Scripture, there's warnings over and over. Solomon, at the end of his life, comes to the conclusion, the whole of man, the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. When you talk about the sons of God at Genesis, sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, I think it's no different than the sons of God as you come to the New Testament, you have people that choose to believe and obey God versus those who don't. In 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 53, Solomon, as he offers his prayer there, he recognizes there's a separation of the people of the earth. And then he goes on and he compares them to your people Israel, therefore being God's sons. Your people Israel. You go forward to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and he says, For you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Today, we are sons of God. If we give our life to Christ, we live for him according to the biblical pattern. And therefore, we have a Bible answer. Thank you. And now to Brother Hickson. What do I tell my employer when he insists that I call a fellow employee who is a man, she? Brother Hickson. Mike, that's a very interesting question to say the least. I, I can't help but think about the old phrase that was coined some years back, times they are changing. As Brother John was talking just a minute ago, he mentioned something about the, de the degenerate state of our nation. And I don't think that any of us would disagree that things have changed dramatically in America. I remember back in the 1940s, I read where one writer said that divorce was deemed as deviant behavior. Now imagine some 80 years have passed and now we think very little about divorce. Matter of fact, it's just common in America and really around the world. Well, there was a day and time in America when the whole concept of homosexuality, uh, transgenders, the gay lifestyle, that was taboo, somewhat like divorce was. The standard is not 
the culture or what society thinks, but rather the standard is always the Word of God. And you remember Solomon wrote many years ago, Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach unto any people. And so what he's saying is that righteous conduct elevates society, whereas unrighteous conduct destroys society. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were destroyed because of their deviant behavior. Now, we may like that, we may not like that. We may believe it to be the case and we may just throw it out the window. But the fact of the matter is, the record says those cities were destroyed. And we would do well to remember what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2. In talking about the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said they serve as an example, listen to him, to all, A-L-L, who will live ungodly. Now I say all that to simply say that, you know, times they are changing. And we live in a society today where we have to learn to navigate around some of the difficulties, particularly in the moral realm. My, I guess my advice would be, and this is just my advice, but what I would try to do is call an individual by their personal pronoun. In other words, the personal name that they have asked to be addressed by, that's what I would choose to do. Now, that is something that, that I made the decision to do. I don't know how you feel about it. I'm not sure if there is a right or wrong answer here uh, because we're trying to, to navigate in uncharted waters. But to simply try to be kind, respect, respectful, and to, you know, to love people and try to honor them. We don't want to disrespect and, and be unkind to anyone. We want to try to hold to our moral values, but at the same time be respectful to others and do what's right. Thank you, Mike. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness. God is serious about His commands. And He's also serious about His promises. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The earth and its works will be burned up, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What kind of people will we be? Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer, and remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.